Tonight, the final push to Election Day. Control of Congress on the line. Heavy hitters blitzing key states in the final hours of the campaign. President Biden, Obama, and Trump rallying their bases in Pennsylvania. Senate races coming down to the wire there and in Georgia, Nevada, and Arizona. Our team's live on the ground in those battleground states. Plus, the paths to victory tonight. What both parties will need to pull off a win. Your election night roadmap and what our new poll is showing straight ahead. At stake, the future of President Biden's agenda. His policies on immigration, the economy, and the war in Ukraine hanging in the balance. What a red wave would mean for the final two years of his term and the rumblings of a 2024 rematch. President Trump expected to announce another run for the White House at any moment. Also tonight, the dangerous storm off the southern coast, the tropical depression rapidly gaining strength as it takes aim at Florida. Could there be a hurricane this late in the season? We'll bring you the latest track. Overseas, the deadly plane crash. At least 19 people killed after a passenger plane plunged into a lake in Tanzania. The human chain formed in the water, dozens miraculously making it out alive. The investigation into a cause now underway. Plus, the massive high-rise fire, flames shooting up the side of a 35-story building. What authorities say caused the blaze to spread so quickly. And bye bye SATs. Senior year just got a lot harder for dozens of students in Texas. Their finished SAT tests flying out the back of a UPS truck. Why they may have to sit through the exam all over again. Top story starts right now. And good evening. Welcome to Election Eve in America. Our countdown to the midterms now measured in hours, not by days. Both sides pulling out all the stops in the final push in a sign of just how tight these midterm races are. Take a look at this. Three presidents, past and present, out on the trail this weekend in Pennsylvania. Former President Trump in the western part of the state, Trump country, urging Republicans to bring on a red wave. And President Biden and former President Obama rallying voters in the city of Philadelphia. Biden battling a low approval rating heading into tomorrow's election. Take a look at this. The latest NBC poll showing just 44 percent approve of the job he's doing. But a brighter spot for Democrats who have managed to close a nine point enthusiasm gap. Voters on both sides equally pumped up heading into election night. Our team tonight spread out all across the midterm battlegrounds. Once again, Dasha Burns is in Pennsylvania, Ellison Barber in Georgia, Ali Rafa in Arizona, and Jacob Sobroff in Nevada tonight. All states that could determine who wins control of the Senate. We'll have much more with all of them in a moment. But first, I want to bring in NBC News political director and moderator of Meet the Press, Chuck Todd. Chuck, so we've been talking about this number yep. all day today, the approval-disapproval, 44 percent, such a low number for President Biden. But I have to ask you, that other graph we showed yep. as well, enthusiasm. Both sides, Democrats catching up, but you said there's a hitch to it. Look, on this one, there's a big hitch. Independence. Yeah. His approval rating is just 28 percent. It's the lowest number we've ever recorded for him among independents. Independents are the unknown. We talk about partisan enthusiasm is there. It's even. Okay? Yes, America has fewer swing voters than ever, but they exist. And they're not going to be split evenly. And when you look at that, 28% approval rating on that. This is what's why so many Republicans are confident and so many Democrats are nervous. Those independents, they're likely to split three to one in one direction, and it's unlikely to be in the blue direction. But that next stat that we showed there, yeah. is, is, is that a positive sign for Democrats, well, well, the enthusiasm? So there's two sort of theories of the case about these midterms. Is it going to be a wave where it's all about the economy and the party in power? Or does the fact that we've been so polarized as a nation for the last decade prevent big shifts? This tells you maybe... Democratic turnout will be up. The fear and threat of Donald Trump keeps everything, you know, and it prevents a huge shift. So, look, we'll learn early. This is what's needed to make sure a Kathy Hochul can survive or right. a Patty Murray. You know, this is this is what this would mean. So Those it certainly gives governors, Democrats yeah. uh, a boxer's chance here. But you said that historical number, going back to presidents in it's, midterms, it's 44%. I, explain look, this our pollsters yeah. our pollsters believe it's the single most important number to explain a midterm look what a 44 percent job rating meant for bill clinton his 54 party lost seats 54 house seats look what a 45 percent job rating meant for barack obama 63 63 seats. okay 46 percent 40 yeah. seats democrat uh, republicans only need five right. they only need 18 to get to their mark that they had when 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 they won the uh, house in, in right. barack obama what about 30 or 40? That becomes a huge, huge number. The bottom line is, 
At the end of the day, President Biden's unpopularity and the dissatisfaction with this economy, is it a greater force than polarization? That We're going to find that answer out. Tomorrow's going to be such an important night because explain the balance of power here. It, mm -hmm. it is so close. So there's going to be a lot of races that we're watching very closely. Well, this is the point. Do you know this is the highest number a party out of power has had in the House? 212. Because what people forget... Joe Biden had no coattails in 2020. Right. In fact, he had reverse coattails. Republicans picked up House seats yeah. in 2020. So they only need to get to 218. They don't need much. And so you could see how quickly this could go from 212 to, look, anything 230 or above, the Republicans have a governing majority. So this is why, for me, 18 is my over-underline. Yeah. Anything less than 18, it's a disappointing night for Republicans. 18 plus, you start to... You start to ask yourself how big a night's And then the Senate, it's even closer, 50-50. the Senate it takes is, a seat. It's, look, it's one seat, and Senate races can be personal. Now, we're going to find out. If it is about, if, if candidates matter, Democrats are going to feel good about Georgia, they're going to feel mm -hmm. good about Arizona, and they're going to feel good about uh, Pennsylvania. But if partisanship matters, and if the economy yeah. is what matters, then you'd rather be Herschel Walker. You'd rather be... Like Masters, you'd rather be you'd rather be a Republican going into tomorrow than a Democrat generically, and so we'll see. Look, they've made a lot of character attacks Democrats have against these Republican nominees. The question is: Is the economy sour enough where character doesn't matter? Right. And then I have to ask you: I mean, it's going to be a long night. We're broadcasting from mm -hmm. 6 p.m. all the way till 2 a.m. probably. Right. What are some of the races early in the night? So we're looking at the at, at the Eastern races that you're going to say. This could set the tone, or there could be a right. pattern here. Look, on the Senate front, we should at least know if Georgia's going to be in a runoff or not before yeah. before 6 a.m. the next morning. And we sh might get a Pennsylvania call before 6 a.m. So those two, we should have an idea. Some of these others, Arizona, Nevada, could be weeks. But right. early on, the state of Virginia. Yeah. If, you know, there's three House races in particular that I call my small, medium, and large wave House okay. races to watch. Virginia 2, Virginia Beach. If Republicans only win that one... They're going to get the majority, but it's not a wave. Yeah. They get number seven and number two, which is Abigail Spanberger and Elaine Luria. Yeah. Then you're starting to call it a wave. And then there's the 10th congressional district, which is Northern Virginia, uh, uh, and a woman named Jennifer Wexton. If they get that one, then we're talking, we're going to be wondering about Patty yeah. Murray in Washington State. We're going right. to be wondering about Kathy Hochul here in New York State. Yeah, and, and a lot of Republicans here in New York think that that, that is a possibility when months ago... They weren't too sure. It, it, I will say this. There's two things that I wonder in the back of my head. Number one, did Lee Zeldin peak too soon? And this last 48 hours, has there been too much Donald Trump for the Republican Party? Well, that's definitely the And is that going to help yeah. Democrats at the end with some of their younger voters who right now don't look like they're going to show up? All right, Chuck Todd. We'll be talking a lot tomorrow. Yes, Great to have you tonight. Right, we want to turn now to the battleground state of Pennsylvania. We were just talking so much about it. With their key Senate race in a dead heat, both parties spent the weekend sending in star power, hoping to turn out voters. Dasha Burns is there with the latest. Across Pennsylvania, closing arguments in a long campaign. Political heavyweights rallying in the state. Two former presidents and the current one, all stumping for the hotly contested Senate and governor races. You're going to elect the incredible slate of true America first Republicans up and down the ballot. President Obama also firing up voters, warning the future of democracy could be at stake. Don't complain. Don't mope. Don't tune out. Get off your couch and do what? With the Pennsylvania Senate race between Mehmet Oz and John Fetterman in a dead heat, both campaigns hoping to boost turnout in the moderate Philadelphia suburbs. Oz has gained ground there since their only debate. And if we do this all together, we will win big time on Tuesday. Are you all in? The last-minute messages flooding the airwaves with new campaign ads released today. One candidate stands with the people, John Fetterman. In what is the second most expensive Senate America race in the country, with $260 million spent. You. When you save the soul of Pennsylvania, you save the soul of America. And it's not just on the air. The Get Out the Vote campaign, also a ground war. Oh. In full swing for Democrats here in Pittsburgh. Why did you decide to volunteer? Why are you so passionate about this election? Because there is nothing more important right now than preserving democracy. 
making sure that John Fetterman gets elected and fills that one important seat that takes us over 50 percent in the Senate. Election day turnout could be critical. Officials in Philadelphia already asking for patience. As long as you're in line, by the time the polls close at 8 p.m., you will be able to vote. While things are very tight on the Senate side, the governor's race is widening, with Republican Doug Mastriano trailing Democrat Josh Shapiro by double digits in the polls. Looking at your race versus the Senate race, you have a wide margin, a wide lead ahead of your opponent, Doug Mastriano. The Senate race, though, is neck and neck. Why do you think there's such a difference between these two races? Well, look, I mean, I'm for John Fetterman, obviously, and you couldn't have a clearer contrast in both of these races, but I'm focused on my race, making the case against Doug Mastriano, who's by far the most dangerous and extreme candidate running for office in the nation. All right, Dasha Burns joins us now live from Pittsburgh tonight. So, Dasha, I want to ask you about that last question there. You mentioned the governor's race. Is there a real concern now that Doug Mastriano could pull down Dr. Oz on the Republican side? Well, it's a really good question, Tom, especially because in the last few months of this race, Oz has really tried to cast himself as a moderate here, trying to win over those purple suburbs that are so critical around Philadelphia. And the question is, will his appearance with Trump and with Mastriano over the weekend potentially hurt his chances there? It's entirely possible. The thing that Democrats are hoping for, though, on their end is that Shapiro, Josh Shapiro, the Democratic candidate for governor, might might be able to pull up John Fetterman and help pull him over the edge in a win for Democrats here, Tom. Okay, our Dasha Burns has been doing phenomenal reporting out of Pennsylvania for months now. Dasha, we appreciate it. We want to head to Georgia now where the latest polling has Senator Raphael Warnock and his GOP challenger Herschel Walker essentially tied. Meanwhile, in the governor's race, incumbent Governor Brian Kemp holding on to his lead. Closely following this Senate race for us is Ellison Barber, who spent a lot of time there in Georgia for us. She's live from Atlanta tonight. So, Ellison, we saw in those polls how close this race is in Georgia when it comes to the Senate race there. What are you hearing from voters? Is there a lot of enthusiasm on both sides? Yeah, people are definitely paying attention. Uh, a lot of the voters we've spoken to, almost every voter, regardless of political affiliation, mentions the economy, the cost of living, inflation as one of their top issues. But it's not the only issue. It is a big one, but they often, especially as we get closer to Election Day, add other issues that they're paying attention to as well. A lot of Republican-leaning voters we've spoken to in this state of late say that they feel like this is a vote for change in Washington, D.C. A lot of the Democratic voters we've spoken spoken to of late, they say that they feel like democracy as well as character is on the ballot. Here's some more of what we've been hearing. I think we need to make a change in, in the uh, direction that we're headed with inflation. Uh, I voted Republican today. And the reason being uh, the pandemic mostly and the economy, right? Uh, how they handled the pandemic. I just feel the issue of abortion is uppermost in my mind. I don't care about the economy or inflation. Inflation is all, already there all the time, but... I didn't really consider uh, Herschel Walker. I kind of feel like he's along the lines of um, personality candidate, kind of like uh, the former President Trump. The stakes in this race are very high. This is a race that could very well determine which party controls the United States Senate. Georgia voters are aware of that. They are paying attention. They seem very engaged. At the same time, Tom, every single person I have spoken to, they say, we're so ready for this to be done. We're ready for the ads to end. The question is, will it end Tuesday night? Because at this point, there's a very good chance that it could go to a runoff in this state. Yeah, Tom. Allison, speaking of those ads, we know they've gotten pretty vicious over the last few days. We're on the election eve. Have you noticed anything different? Tomorrow will be the big day of voting, though this is incredible. I have a stat here. 2.5 million Georgia voters already casting their ballots. Yeah, I mean, that number, it is the highest number for early voting, not just in recent midterms, but in the state's history. Turnout has just blasted uh, records, but you still look at this race and things are incredibly, incredibly close. This is one of the most expensive races in the country. Warnock has outspent Walker by about $78 million. It's gotten increasingly messy. You mentioned the ads, the attacks. They've just become more and more personal. Walker and Warnock are both 
Republicans trying to paint the other as wholly unqualified to serve in the United States Senate. Walker was accused of paying for and encouraging two different women to have an abortion, a claim, both of those claims that he adamantly denied. But to have a staunch anti-abortion candidate accused of something like that, it's a very big deal. But then you look at the polls and the polls here in this race, things really have not changed for more than a month. Right now, most polls have these two candidates in a statistical tie. I think the big takeaway for me is when you look at all of that is how little it has done to change things in the polls. It seems like this state might be a reflection of how politically divided we are as a nation. Tom. All right, Ellison Barber for us. Ellison, we appreciate that. We'll be checking in with you tomorrow on the election night. And now we go to Arizona, where we're watching those high-profile Senate and governor races there tonight. The state also dealing with threats to election workers hours before polls open. Ali Rafa joins us now live from Phoenix tonight. Ali, I want to ask you more about those election worker threats. But first, can you give us the latest in these races when it comes to the governor and the Senate race there? Polls also very tight uh, in the race for Governor Kerry Lake getting a lot of attention. And then in the Senate race, Senator Mark Kelly trying to hold off that challenge from Blake Masters. Yeah, Tom, those two races among the most closely watched, not just here in Arizona, but nationally, because of how tight the margins have become, uh, not only in the last few a few weeks, really the last few days. Take a look uh, at some of the most recent polling in the senator's race, specifically between Democratic incumbent Mark Kelly, Republican uh, Blake Masters. Uh, Kelly at 50 percent to Masters, 47 percent, well within that margin of error in that poll. The race also moving from a lean Dem to a toss-up in the last few days. So that race, really anyone's game at this point. And that's really what we're seeing in the governor's race as well between Republican Carrie Lake and the state's Democratic Secretary of State, Katie Hobbs. Those two almost at a 50-50 evenly divided split compared to September uh, when Katie Hobbs had a uh, over three-point lead over Carrie Lake. All of this reflecting really what we're seeing at this polling location in Phoenix today. We've spoken to a couple voters coming in and out of this polling location, an even split between Democrats and Republicans, Tom. Okay, Allie, over the weekend, though, you mentioned Carrie Lake there. A staffer opened an envelope containing a suspicious white powder. This is at her campaign headquarters in Phoenix. She was on Fox News yesterday with an update. Here's some of what she had to say. Um, the FBI came in to investigate along with Phoenix police, uh, Phoenix fire, and even the bomb squad came out and sweeped the building. So they, they deemed it to be a threat, and they're investigating. We're monitoring our, our staff members' health to make sure this is uh, nothing that affects their health. Hopefully it doesn't. So far, so good. And we feel confident that it's in the right hands. They are analyzing the substance and hopefully we'll have some answers for us soon. So, Ali, is this having any impact there on, on that governor's race? And I do want to also ask you, because there's been a large problem with threats being made against election workers. More than 100 violent threats have been, been made against uh, workers in Maricopa County alone. So, so what exactly is happening there? Yeah, so we know Carrie Lake was not present at her campaign headquarters last night. She was in Scottsdale, so she wasn't exposed to that substance. Uh, but this really raised the stakes and made everyone aware uh, and uh, even more uh, aware of the threats and, and violent threats that are coming uh, in these last few days before the election, not just to Carrie Lake's campaign, uh, but to all of the campaigns here in Arizona. This comes as Democratic and Republican officials here in this state say in their decades covering Arizona elections, they have never seen threats to this extent, violent threats, intimidating threats. Uh, and that is uh, that was v definitely brought up uh, earlier today. I actually had an interview uh, with the Maricopa County um, Sheriff Paul Penzone, who talked about the measures that he's taking to keep everyone safe, not only tomorrow, but in the next few days. Because remember, we know that this election uh, won't likely be called uh, tomorrow. It'll likely take a couple days. He told me uh, that he plans to have officers on horseback that are trained in crowd control measures. Uh, they will also have helicopters that will be monitoring uh, the transport of the ballot boxes from these polling locations to the recorder's office. Take a listen to a little bit more of what he told me. We understand this. We're going to do the best we can to protect people. And sometimes that means that um, some folks who are good people in the wrong place at the wrong time suffer in some way. You know, we've deployed gas. We have to be forceful in a certain capacity. Use good judgment. Be better people. It makes our job a heck of a lot easier, especially if you're one of those people that profess you support law enforcement, then abide by our directives and help us get the job done. 
Penn Zone, reminding Arizona voters to be patient because, like I said, uh, it is very unlikely that we will have final results tomorrow night, Tom. And OK, Ali Rafa, we appreciate it. Now I want to head to what may be the most consequential state of all of this, Nevada. The economy looming large as voters head to the polls there. The state's unemployment rate in September higher than the national average and one of the highest rates in Clark County, home to Las Vegas, of course. Nevada residents also feeling the pain at the pump. Take a look at this. The price for a gallon of gas there is $4.96 in comparison to the national average of $3.80. NBC News correspondent Jacob Sobroff joins us now from outside Clark County Election Headquarters. Jacob, so great to have you on Top Story tonight. Jacob, you know, I, I, I want to veer off from what we had planned here because I'm, I'm thinking about this election and so many people think, listen, maybe the Republicans and the Democrats, they split the Senate races in Pennsylvania and Georgia. Arizona, the Dems defend that. It comes down to Nevada there. Are, are you feeling that type of pressure? Are, 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 the, are the parties feeling that type of pressure that the entire Senate could be basically based on the outcome there in Nevada? There's no doubt about it, Tom. I was here actually exactly two years ago, stood outside this building uh, when this place became the focal point of the nation because uh, the election count here went all the way from the Tuesday after the first Monday in November election day uh, all the way uh, to Saturday. And because this is such a toss up state, touch a, such a swing state with such critical voting blocks, uh, probably at the top of the list, Latino voters here. It's got one of the highest Latino populations in the entire United States. All eyes uh, are on it, and, and especially because it's one of the centers of election disinformation in the United States. Adam Laxalt, the Senate challenger to Senator Cortez Masto, uh, stood out here and gave a press conference with Matt Schlapp, uh, Rick Rennell, uh, and said two years ago that there were thousands of illegitimate ballots counted inside this building. Of course, that turned out to be a completely untrue claim uh, that was debunked not only by the Republican Secretary of State, but by other independent uh, investigations. So the election process itself here is critical. The state itself is critical because of how close ultimately people expect it to be here. Uh, and it's a, it's a result that we may not have, uh, Tom, uh, on tomorrow night, Tuesday night. Yeah, no, that is so true. We're going to have to wait and see. Jacob, you mentioned the Latino vote. Latino voters so important heading into this midterm election. We've been covering this for many months now on Top Story, especially though they're in Nevada. The local culinary workers union, along with the local bartenders union, representing 60,000 workers in Las Vegas alone and also Reno. That's the largest labor union in Nevada and a group that's 50 4% Latino. I know that union's been knocking on doors for the Democrats. You spoke to those canvassers. What was that experience like? What'd you learn? It's been amazing. We've actually been pounding the pavement with them over the course of the last couple of days. You said they're 60,000 strong. About 500 of them have been going door to door. They've gone to a million different houses, doing just like what you're looking at on your screen, just walking down the middle of the street, uh, trying to figure out who's home, who's not home, to connect with voters. They've had 165,000 conversations with people uh, all across the Las Vegas area. They say they've talked to half of the eligible Latino population uh, in the state, half the eligible black population in the state, a third of the eligible AAP. Uh, population in the state. And what's amazing, Tom, is that the issue that keeps coming to the fore is affordability. You said in your introduction that this is the state with one of the highest uh, inflation rates, also one of the highest um, uh, unemployment rates uh, in the country. And people are feeling that pain and they're feeling it badly here in Nevada. Yeah, the cost of living hurting so many. Finally, Jacob, I know the U.S. Justice Department says it's going to monitor polls in Nevada's two largest metro areas to check in on their compliance with federal voting rights laws. You spoke today right before the show with the Clark County election chief. Let's Take a quick listen to that interview. They're not here because of civil rights violations. They're here to monitor to make sure that they don't that there are no civil rights violations. So We're, it's right. not unusual for them to be here. Uh, they were here in 2020. Uh, they come around. I usually don't even see them. They end up giving me a report when the election is over. So we're very happy that they're going to be here. This is the largest county in the state of Nevada. So we heard about a little bit about that, what was happening in Arizona. I is this been happening, I mean, over the past few elections, or is this sort of a continuation of what we saw in 2020? It is a continuation of what we saw in 2020, Tom. Outside this very building two years ago, uh, there were dozens and dozens of people who were lining the streets, uh, protesting ultimately the results of the election. And remember, election administrators are nonpartisan officials, but even their own security was put into question here in Nevada. They got more police presence outside uh, this facility today than we saw two years ago uh, while we were here. I think what Joe Gloria said uh, is, is very telling and it's very important that they welcome the presence of the Department of Justice just in case there are violations of people 
actual federal uh, voting rights uh, here in Nevada. It's an acknowledgement that voter intimidation happens. He's also very confident, and in that interview, he also said to me he's very confident that the integrity of the vote that's counted inside this building uh, will be upstanding, and the people can count on not only their votes being cast, but their votes being counted here in Clark County, Nevada. All right, Jacob Soberoff also doing some phenomenal reporting from Nevada. Jacob, we could come down to that state in the Senate. We'll be checking in with you a lot tomorrow night. Okay, these elections putting President Biden's agenda on the line. Low approval ratings haunting Biden and his party while Republicans seem to gain momentum. NBC's chief White House correspondent Kristen Welker has the details. Tonight, with his agenda and control of Congress on the line, President Biden on the trail, dismissing his low approval ratings, saying the election is not about his record. Look, this election isn't a referendum, it's a choice. It's a choice between two fundamentally different visions of America. The president aiming to paint a dire picture if Republicans win. Tax credits for lower energy costs, gone. 50 percent corporate minimum tax, gone. With Republicans showing momentum in this final sprint, the top GOP leader in the House previewing their agenda, vowing to target inflation by reducing spending. You've got to curtail government spending. Incentivize people to go to work, not to stay home. Don't pay them more to stay home. Kevin McCarthy, who would likely be the new House yeah, Speaker if Republicans fun. win, saying the GOP would tackle the migrant crisis at the border first. If Democrats lose the Senate, Republicans could also block President Biden's judicial nominees and look for a change on congressional investigations. The House inquiry into January 6th would likely end. Instead, the GOP signaling they'll start investigations into the origins of COVID and the business dealings of Hunter Biden, who's currently under a federal criminal probe. Another likely major shift on Ukraine. President Biden saying he supports no limit on American military aid to that country. We are going to support Ukraine as long as it takes. While McCarthy suggesting a Republican Congress could pull back on taxpayer money for Ukraine. It means no blank checks for anything. We have a $31 trillion debt. I think the American people deserve that. All right, Kristen Welker joins us tonight from the White House. Kristen, you know, we'll know in the coming days who's going to control Congress, but also a lot of implications in these midterms for what 2024 means as well. Tom, that's absolutely right. Look, if Republicans have a strong showing, there will be mounting pressure on President Biden to officially declare whether he'll run again in 2024. The president has said he intends to, while on the Republican side, sources tell me former President Trump is itching to announce he's jumping into the race. So we're watching both very closely, Tom. Okay, Kristen Welker for us tonight. Kristen, we appreciate it. And make sure to tune into our election night coverage special. Hallie Jackson and I kick off the night with a News Now special starting at 6 p.m. Eastern. We'll have reporters in all those battleground states, plus live analysis as polls begin to close on election night. Our coverage continues then at 8 p.m. Okay, still ahead, the chemical plant fire, explosions erupting at a plant in Georgia, the evacuations now underway, and the potential threat for residents in the area. Plus, the tropical threat. That's right, a system taking aim at South Florida that could strengthen to a rare November hurricane before making landfall. And new video showing a beer being thrown at Senator Ted Cruz during the Astros victory parade. The arrest just made. Stay with us. Top story just getting started on this Monday. All right, we're back now with a look at the weather, and we're tracking the tropics yet again in November. Subtropical storm Nicole heading for the Bahamas set to make landfall on Florida's east coast as early as Wednesday night. Tropical alerts in effect with fears of storm surge as high as five feet possible. Bill Cairns joins us now in studio. So, Bill, time this out for us and what you think. Yeah, we wanted to be done with Ian. I mean, we didn't right. want to. You know, yes, hurricane season goes to the end of November for a reason. This has happened before. We've even had a Category 3 hit Florida in the month of November before. This one will not do that. This is a big, huge, messy storm, and it's going to have impacts far from the center. So, yes, we have this center cone. What we know is that north of this is where the worst of the conditions will be for storm surge and the highest wind gusts and the worst that we're going to deal with those big waves and the beach erosion. So that's going to be roughly from about Fort Pierce, Jupiter, northwards, up through the Space Coast, Brevard, and Volusia counties. This is going to be Wednesday evening. That's the peak of the storm. And if it does get to hurricane strengths, that's when you would hear the landfall. It will be late Wednesday, early Thursday morning. And again, as far as the track then, it weakens and just kind of makes like a big rain event up the East Coast. By far, the biggest story is going to be where we get that landfall. And, Tom, storm surge will be an issue. Remember with Ian, we had storm surge at 10 to 15 feet. 
This is three to five feet. This is not going to be devastating, but this will cause some damage. Okay, Bill, we've been talking about the election, of course. Give us the election day forecast, if you will. Yeah, we've highlighted a bunch of our Senate races that we're watching very closely, and everything in the East looks pretty good. I'm going to focus my attention here in the West, Nevada, of all places. This big storm is moving through California tomorrow. We are going to have snow in the high elevations. Even Las Vegas, after 10 a.m., is going to have heavy rain and gusty winds. So Las Vegas, of all places, is going to have some of the worst weather on Election Day. And we know for a fact from research that bad weather tends to impact more the turnout from Democrats than Republicans. And turnout will be a big deal in the state of Nevada, something to watch. Watch tomorrow. Bill Cairns dipping his toe in the political world. Mm -hmm. Wow, man of many talents. All right, when we come back, wave goodbye to those SAT scores, a truckload of test papers spilling out onto the street. The unlucky students now forced to retake their exams. That's next. All right, we are back now with Top Stories News Feeding. We begin with the deadly shooting on board a SEPTA train in Philadelphia. Police say the suspect opened fire on the moving train at 2.30 this afternoon. A 21-year-old man was shot 11 times. He later died at the hospital. A 16-year-old was also shot in the arm, but he is expected to survive. Police are now searching for that gunman. Evacuations underway in coastal Georgia after a fire broke out inside a chemical plant. New video shows smoke plumes emitting from the fragrance plant in Brunswick. Multiple explosions reported, and more are possible as chemicals there burn. Residents within a one-mile radius of the plant were evacuated. A Shelter in place is also in effect as authorities monitor that air quality. So far, at least one firefighter hurt. No word yet on the cause. And a Texas man is under arrest tonight for throwing a beer at Senator Ted Cruz during the Astros World Series parade. It was all caught on video. You can see it here. Cruz attempting to block the beer can that was thrown at him from the crowd in downtown Houston. The senator was not hurt. Police confirming to NBC News a 33-year-old man was taken into custody. No word yet on what those charges will be. Okay, turning now to a nightmare for some high school students in Texas. If you thought taking the SATs was bad, imagine if your scores disappeared. That's what's happening in El Paso after a UPS truck carrying those tests open while driving. Our Nayala Charles has more. Hours upon hours of studying gone in the blink of an eye. I just saw a bunch of papers everywhere. I had no idea what it was. I didn't think much of it, but I just decided to grab my phone and record it. Video capturing more than 200 SAT tests flying out of a UPS truck in El Paso, Texas. I looked and I could see the bubbles. Some people found the visual funny at first. My mom, as a joke, was like, oh, they're your PSAT scores. Until seniors at El Paso High realized it was their SAT scantrons, sharing the news on social media. Today, I just found out that they were actually the SAT scores from our school. The district says the faculty combed the streets collecting those tests. However, 55 weren't recovered, meaning those students may have to sit through that three-hour test again. Since the pandemic, many colleges don't require standardized testing, but according to data from the college board, who runs the SAT, almost 2 million high school seniors still took the test last year. In a statement, the college board said they will work with El Paso High School to ensure students can retest as soon as possible. But in the meantime, students' concerns go beyond college admissions. We have all our information and identification on the score, and it stinks because our, our identity is out there right now. All right, Nyla Charles joins us now from Los Angeles. So, Nyla, has UPS said how this happened? Tom, is crazy, right? Though they didn't say how the driver lost the test, UPS does apologize for the mishap in a statement into NBC News, adding, quote, our employees work to recover as many tests as possible. The driver's actions in this case are not representative of UPS protocols and methods, and we have addressed this with him. Tom? And Nyella, what is the school district offering for those students affected? Well, for now, it's unclear if those students will have to retake the SAT and how soon that would be possible if so. However, the district did say if any of those students want to take the ACT, which is a different standardized test, it would be waived. Also, Tom, I do want to mention College Board tells us none of the students' sensitive information is in jeopardy. Tom? Okay, good to know. Nyla Charles, thank you. Now to ongoing trouble with Twitter ahead of the midterm elections. The tech giant's new owner, Elon Musk, endorsing a political party ahead of the midterms. Musk writing, quote, today, to independent-minded voters, shared power curbs the worst excesses of both parties. Therefore, I recommend voting for a Republican Congress, given that the presidency is Democratic.
Musk's squeak coming as his company struggles to combat misinformation and speech issues. The company now saying it will delay its push to make users pay for account verification at least until after the midterms. I want to bring in our panel, New York Times reporter Blake Hausnell. He's the editor of the On Politics newsletter and NBC News senior political editor, my good friend Mark Murray. Guys, thanks so much for joining me tonight. Blake, I want to start with you. We heard what Musk posted today. But back in April, he said this. We want to put it on the screen. For Twitter to deserve public trust, it must be politically neutral, which effectively means upsetting the far right and the far left equally. What do you think is driving his decision to tweet that today? Uh, I don't want to read too much rationality into it. Um, the guy has been tweeting about 25 times a day since he formally bought Twitter on October 28th. He just seems to tweet everything that pops into his head, much like the rest of us, except for the fact that he's the world's richest man and owns Twitter. Yeah, but I mean, you, you cover politics for the New York Times. You've been covering this issue of misinformation. You had a great read in the paper today. Uh, how much does this, do you think, affect anything? Or, or does it even matter at all? I, I'm not sure it matters. I mean, Twitter is really um, a relatively small platform compared to things like TikTok and Facebook. But I think Musk is really reflecting you know, sort of the mood of the country. There's a real anti-incumbent mood, and I, he, he probably put his finger in the wind and uh, saw which way it's blowing. Blake, I, I disagree with you just a little bit. I'm going to bring this question to Mark, and here's why. Mark, I, I think, and, and I mean, I'm not going to surprise you with this, I think Twitter in part at times can become groupthink, right? And both politicians and journalists can stop thinking, and suddenly they just think whatever's on Twitter, that's, that's got to be what I'm thinking. So I, we're probably not going to see that with, with Musk's tweet, but Twitter does have a power. I mean, there's no doubt it has a power, especially in our industry. Oh, to affect perceptions, yeah. to actually, like, say who won a debate or not. I mean, Tom, the best of Twitter is actually getting breaking news or to be able to dis disseminate right. an interview that you just conducted or a poll that NBC News might have just been able to push to get that information. No faster out. way. Right. But the problem with Twitter, and this actually goes even beyond Elon Musk and his uh, ownership of it, is that the algorithms and everything that's built up for politics or news consumption isn't to actually have a civil information flow of like, hey, NBC News reported this, ABC News, CBS right. reported that. It's, did you hear this incendiary thing? It actually wants uh, controversy. Yeah. It wants uh, people who go against the grain. And sometimes it actually, conspiracy theories get spread more virally than regular news does just because that's how people's brains work and the yeah. algorithm works. And, and it doesn't want a collection of opinions sometimes. It only wants one opinion. Blake, I do want to ask you about the issue of, of misinformation. It's become such a huge issue in our country, especially during uh, election time. And, and what role do you think now that Twitter and Elon Musk has been pretty upfront about this? He sort of wants to let it be just a free freedom of speech platform. But clearly there's a danger with that, especially when it comes to tech and big tech. That's absolutely right. I mean, it was really irresponsible of Musk to do these layoffs in the week before a midterm election where Twitter plays such a central role in disseminating information about just the basics and mechanics of election. And in the days since he bought the platform, there's been a spike in misinformation, things going unchecked. And part of that, from what I hear from inside the company, is that the teams that run those programs have really been gutted. And so that's something that we should all be concerned about, given Twitter's, as Mark mentioned, its, it's centrality to the public square right now. You know, Blake, you, you point out in your piece that Twitter aside, election skepticism is part of a decades-long trend of declining trust in institutions. Just 27% of Americans, I think we have this year, look at that, they have a high degree of confidence. That's, that, 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 that's so pathetic. But that declining trust combined with the rise of platforms like Twitter, could can Twitter do anything better? Can they reverse the course, or is the genie out of the bottle at this point? Is it just too toxic of an environment? Yeah, I mean, people have pointed out to me that when Amazon has problems with reviews of its books, when when dis, uh, when bad actors uh, glom onto book reviews and game the system, they pounce. And I think uh, that's instructive. A, a platform like Twitter or Facebook, they can devote a lot more resources to finding uh, bot behavior or bad actors and snuffing it out more quickly. And the fact that so many people were laid off recently is disturbing because that's going to affect their ability to, uh, you know, moderate lies about the election. 
Finally, as, as, as I want to wrap this up here, Mark, but I do want to ask you, as we talk about the future of Twitter, do you think journalists can ever quit Twitter? It, it, it seems like it's, it's just become entrenched in our industry. And so, so many people not only rely on it, but I feel like they're a little addicted to it. Well, and Tom, it's, I think it's important to note, and Blake was just mentioning this, that you know, Twitter overall isn't that popular of a social right. media platform. It mainly is a bunch of political journalists yeah. and like huge consumers of political news, maybe like some sports like yeah. uh, coverage. But we, uh, the best journalism, whether you're at NBC News or you're at the New York Times, you meet people where they are. Right. And I think for us to be able to have our push our reporting, we have to remember like not all that many people are actually on Twitter, and so yeah. we need to whether it's people capturing people by by streaming or have print or digital or podcasts. We need to do it all. But I think sometimes th those of us who've been so reliant as political journalists over yeah. the past decade or so need to remember, like, not everybody's on Twitter. Right. Good, good, good reminder. Mark Murray for us. Blake, thank you so much, too, guys. I really respect in the political world. Thanks for joining Top Story tonight. Okay, we want to head overseas now to Africa, where a plane crashed into a lake in Tanzania. The death toll rising to 19 people after a Tanzanian emergency teams rushed to rescue survivors. Kelly Kobiea has the very latest. Rescuers in Tanzania frantically trying to save victims after a passenger plane crashed into Lake Victoria over the weekend, killing at least 19 people. The flight, which took off from Tanzania's coastal city of Dar es Salaam, carrying 39 passengers and ending in chaos after it failed to land in Bukoba. Officials say storms and heavy rain as the plane approached the airport may have contributed to the crash. The two pilots died. A senior administrator for the Tanzanian government telling Reuters they initially survived and were in touch with rescue workers from the cockpit before communicating their oxygen supply was running low. They were dead when emergency responders reached them, now leaving some questions unanswered. How bad was that weather? Were the flight crew members properly trained? Were they following policies and procedures? Was there a mechanical problem one rescue worker detailing the tense moments after the plane plunged into Africa's largest lake. People opened the emergency door, but as we would try to rescue people, water would surge in. I rescued seven people myself, he said. Harrowing images from the scene show the aircraft almost fully submerged as emergency responders coordinated rescue efforts from small boats, even wading into the water. This accident comes five years after another plane crash in northern Tanzania that killed 11. On Monday, grieving Tanzanians attending a heart-wrenching ceremony where the bodies of the victims were handed off to their families. The nation's prime minister paying respects at the victims' coffins and saying at least 26 people were rescued. As an investigator, you're going to always look back in history. You're going to want to know what kind of issues this airline may have experienced in the past. Were they being overseen by a regulatory authority? Had they been violated? In a statement, the airline Precision Air, writing in part that it, quote, extends its deepest sympathies to the family and friends of the passengers and crew involved in this tragic accident and says it will continue to provide support for victims and their families. It's not yet clear what caused the plane to miss the airport other than bad weather. But the prime minister says he's eager to investigate, saying yesterday is a tragic accident and we believe it will never happen again. Tom. OK, Kelly Cobiea for us. Kelly, thank you. Still ahead, the high rise inferno, 35 stories of an apartment building. Look at that going up in flames. Why officials say that fire spread so quickly. Stay with us. Okay, we're back now with Top Stories Global Watch, and anyone ordering a new iPhone may have to wait a little longer than expected. Apple says COVID restrictions is forcing one of its factories in central China to operate on, quote, significantly reduced capacity. The company now warning production and shipments of iPhone 14 Pros and iPhone 14 Pro Maxes could be delayed as we near the holiday season. Not good news there. A massive fire at a high-rise apartment building in Dubai. Take a look at this. New video shows the blaze ripping up the side of the 35-story building. The fire, just minutes from the Burj Khalifa, the tallest building in the world. All residents were evacuated safely. No one was hurt. It's still unclear what started this massive fire, but flammable material in the building siding helped it spread. In northern Colombia, heavy rains triggering devastating landslides over the weekend. The new video shows the aftermath. At least 70 homes completely destroyed 
More than 80 families evacuating in time, though. Officials say a low-pressure system in the region caused more than 24 hours of constant rain. Okay, coming up next, our countdown to election night continues. The one, the only, Hallie Jackson. Join us live in studio here on Top Story with a look ahead to our special coverage. That's right, Hallie, come in. The water's warm. There we go. With a little dance, we appreciate it. We're coming right back, a Hallie Jackson takeover. Stay with us. We are back and look, look who's joining me on set. Hello, friends. It's like an election night miracle. Hallie Jackson. It's like it's like Christmas Eve, but election night. <laughs> Before we start, though, before we get into it, okay. I want to take you at home. We're inside 30 Rock for a look at what it will look like tomorrow on set. Take a look. Drone. It's coming in, Hallie. I can't wait. I, I, I hope it's not going to be there tomorrow because it, it'll be a little too much. I hope much. it is. It every, might be. We have literally every angle covered. The backs um, of our heads, the sides of our... <laughs> it's going to be good. Hallie, so you, you live and breathe politics I every do. day of your life. What are you excited about tomorrow? Um, from our coverage or from like a race perspective? Yeah, from coverage and everything. So listen, I think the cool thing about tomorrow um, is going to be, first of all, we'll be here together. I just yeah. want people to know that, right? We've been teasing this on my show and on your show yeah. that we have this special coverage starting at 6 o'clock Eastern. However you are streaming or watching Tom right. tonight, that's how you'll see us. And we've talked about this a lot in our meetings, um, really showcasing the incredible bre breadth and depth of the reporters we have in the field. We have, I'm not just saying this because yeah. I work for NBC, we have the best reporters covering these races. Yeah. and. We want to talk to them. We want to hear from them. We want to know. We're going to have exit polls coming out, right, as we're coming yeah. on the air. We want to know what's happening, right? So it's going to be super um, up to the minute. You're going to see things as they go down. We're going to be sort of living in the moment. And you're going to have, what it, truly, truly, these people have been living in these places right, for, for, months, for months. Yeah. In these key states like Georgia and Pennsylvania and Arizona. Nobody knows it better than they do, and we get to take advantage of that. Which Plus, I'm we're going to have about. incredible analysts on the right, That's on right. the left. That's right. People like Chuck Todd, who are going to break it down, can so able to tell people. us, like, yeah, yeah, just the best, the best of NBC News. Um, truly, we, we're not saying that because we get paid yeah. to say it. I mean, but it is. No, it's, it's going to be great. It's going to be a huge night. So explain to our viewers, because it's always good to have a primer and a reminder. Yes. Why do election nights take so long? This time around. Well, this and this one, we really are prepping for for something that's going to be like election days. week. It, yeah. But truly, and I think people need to prepare for that, right? That like it is entirely likely that we are not going to call the Senate balance of power on Tuesday night. Yeah. That's the and that's the big thing, right? Because keep in mind, balance of power in the Senate and the House are at stake. We may know the House because it's it's not going to take many seats for Republicans to flip to be able to take yeah. control and to potentially install a House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Um, the Senate is the one. I just funny as right before I mm -hmm. danced into your studio, I was on the phone with some people just talking to like, what's the mood? How are people feeling? And like, Republicans are super psyched. Yeah. And Democrats are not. You know, right. and I mean, that I mean, it just encapsulates it. We know that because it is so close in the Senate. Going to come down to Georgia. I think you have optimism on both sides on yeah. PA. I think Dems probably feel a little bit better there. I think Dems do not feel good about Nevada, another key. Well, I was going to say, I, it, I was talking to Jacob. It could come down to Nevada. Oh, but They truly, could be splitting, truly, and then yeah. we could be waiting on Nevada. Right, which is going to come in later. So remember, polls close at different times mm -hmm. later on the West Coast. People are doing a lot of mail-in ballots now. A lot of people voted early. Different states have different rules as to when yeah. you can count. So I think people need to brace for the fact that, like, yes, election night is going to be really intense and interesting. And then so is Wednesday and yeah. Thursday and Friday. And, and speaking of all of that, uh, we first met on the campaign trail. We were, we, 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 we were competitors. Um, I think we were friends, yeah. We were definitely competitors. We um, each other, sure. Um, but we met on the Trump campaign trail, and, and, yes. and the former president is teasing that he's going to announce. Some people thought it could possibly even be tonight. Some people are saying it could be next Monday. It could be whenever he wants. But he definitely, it sounds and it feels like he wants it. What, you what, what is your thinking? I think he's going to do it, yeah. So, um, I, you know, if there's one thing I knew, sort of learned covering Donald Trump for the years that I covered him when he was at the White House, it was that he, he also is somebody, and I think this is objectively okay to say, like, he's somebody who likes to put things out there as trial balloons and see oh, yeah. how they go and see how they float and change his mind at the last minute, even against what all of his advisors would say, right? right? Like, so, sure, it could happen before Thanksgiving. Um, 
it could also happen in the spring. I actually think right. that's a totally realistic possibility. Let the let it sit out there in the ether for a little bit. That could happen to well, spring. You, you know that uh, probably. I don't, I don't think so. I, I don't think like definitely. Yeah. But I think there's a chance. I, I I'm hard pressed to see how. It goes I think he wants to roll it out, scare yeah, all the fish out of the deal. water. Try, he won't. But try and, to. and 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 move on. I don't on. think. Do you think Ron? You know Florida. You think Ron DeSantis is going to not think, run? I, I spoke to a source today. A lot of Republicans are concerned if he does run. Who else will run? Who'll be brave enough? And they might announce later. We got to go. We'll, we'll talk more tomorrow. Go. Special election coverage tomorrow, 6 p.m. Uh, these are all the wonderful people that will be on our show. These are all the wonderful people that will be working until 2 o'clock in the morning. We start right here at 6, me and Hallie. Yes. We are so psyched. Thank you so much for watching Top Story. I'm Tom Yamas in New York, a special edition. Hallie Jackson, thank you so much thank for joining us. Me. Stay right there. There is more news always on News Now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.